I'm excited to share with you today as we talk about the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan. Anybody familiar with that story? It's okay. Some of you are. It's okay if you're not because we're going to walk through it here together. And if you're new to church and this parable is new to you, it's all right. Just take some time. Take it in. It's, it's got a really basic meaning to it, and we're going to go over that today. If you're joining us online or on the podcast, thank you so much for choosing to tune in here today as well. And again, I just want to encourage you, stick with this. We're going to walk through it. We're going to help you understand what Jesus is trying to explain to us here. And to kick it off, we're going to give you this basic definition. And Pastor Brian has shared this with you guys. Our basic definition of a parable is this. It's a practical story that illustrates a biblical principle or a spiritual principle, a practical story that illustrates a spiritual principle. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to break the parable of the Good Samaritan down based on that definition. We're going to talk about what was this practical story, and then we're going to talk about what is the spiritual principle that Jesus is trying to teach us here, and then we're going to talk about how does this apply to us. Because I don't know if you know this, but we're different than the crowd that he was preaching to. That was a long time ago, so we have to talk about how does that spiritual principle apply to our lives today. Now, our text is going to be in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn there. If you don't have a Bible, uh, you can pull out your phone and go to the YouVersion app, or the scriptures will be on the screen. You'll also see them on your screen if you are watching this online. And I want to start by setting the stage for you for just a moment. Now, when we jump into this parable, when when these screens or when these uh, scriptures show up on your screen, what you're going to notice is that the word he is underlined in several places. And I did that because Luke uses the word he a lot in this parable. And I wanted you to be clear on the he that was talking about the lawyer that's going to ask Jesus a question in a moment and which he was Jesus. So the he that is Jesus is underlined, it's bold, it's it's capitalized, all that stuff. I just didn't want you to get confused by all the he's that we are about to see. So if you've already turned to Luke chapter 10, let me hear you say, I'm there. there. All right, we're going to be reading starting in verse 25. It says, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he... The lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now, let me break down this first part for you just a little bit. That statement that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all of your strength comes from this practice or this this prayer that the Israelites used to repeat all the time. It's called the Shema, and it's from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, chapter 6, It starts in verse 4, and that word Shema just means to listen, and not just listen, but to let it sink in. So they had this prayer that they would recite that they're saying, it starts, it says, hear, O Israel. So God is talking to Israel, and he's saying, hear this, right? Don't just hear it, though. Let it sink in. He says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Talking about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He is one. And then it says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And so this lawyer who understands that law of Moses very well comes to Jesus and says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Have you ever wondered that yourself? Like how you're going about this life journey and what is it that you can do to inherit eternal life? Let me tell you, there's nothing that you can do to inherit it. But thankfully, we serve a God who saw fit to send his son to die in our place. And because of that sacrifice and his blood poured out over us, we can have eternal life as a free gift. There's nothing you can do to inherit it, though. But if you think about this law, Jesus, the, the lawyer said to Jesus, well, I need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, with all of my being, with all that I am, and then I need to love my neighbor as myself. 
And that second part comes from later in the book of Deuteronomy. So they, they kind of combine these things here. These are these great commandments. And if you think about the Ten Commandments, and again, if you're new to church and you're like, I don't know that, you may have seen it hanging on the, on the wall at the library or in your grandmother's dining room. We have these Ten Commandments pulled from the book of Exodus. And the first half of them deals with how do we love and relate to God. And the second half of them deals with how do we love and relate to our neighbors. And so Jesus said, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But this lawyer is trying to trick Jesus. Now, can you imagine trying to trick Jesus? I'm thinking like I'm walking in this situation and there's one person I'm not going to try to trick. And it's Jesus. Because I've heard about this man. I've heard that he can make limbs grow back. I heard that he can restore sight. I've heard that he can call dead people out of a tomb. He talked to the woman at the well, and he knew stuff about her life that she hadn't shared with anyone. And this lawyer's like, I'm smarter than Jesus. I'm going to trick him. And so the scripture says, seeking to justify himself, he said, who is my neighbor? And this is where we get to the practical story part of This parable, Jesus is going to tell us a practical story to illustrate a spiritual principle. And I hope you are ready to dive into this practical story. We pick it back up in verse 30. Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So let's pause here for a second and talk for a moment. So you have this man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, if you look at a map, Jericho is actually north of Jerusalem, but the reason they say going down is because Jerusalem is is at a higher elevation. And so oftentimes as they would walk this journey, as they were walking down these mountains and through these winding trails, robbers would hide in places where people could not see and they would jump out and rob them. So Jesus tells this practical story that these people had probably heard real life stories about. Like this has happened. That happened to my cousin three months ago. He was walking to Jericho. Same thing happened. Somebody jumped out and they beat him and they robbed him. And so these people are hearing Jesus tell this story. They're like, oh, I've heard about that. And so now you have this priest who happens to be walking by. He's priestly. He's, he's going down. He's going to Jericho, and he sees this robber. And you would think, now, when we think priest, we think, what, Catholic church. And you think the guy with the black shirt with the little white piece here. And you think about the Catholic church. They like to help people. They want to feed people and do all that kind of stuff. So in our mind, a priest would do what? Stop and help. But in this context, no. The priest is like, oh, He's beaten up. He's bleeding. He's unclean. If I touch him, I'm going to be unclean. So you know what? To to make sure I'm not unclean, I'm going to go to the other side of the road. I'm going to go all the way around, and I'm going to pass him by. It says in the next verse, so likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Now, you may be wondering, what's the difference between a priest and a priest? And a Levite, a priest is someone who served the people in a religious manner, but a Levite is someone who served in the temple. He served God in a religious manner. The Levites were a tribe of Israel that God had set apart just for service in his temple. And so you have this person who regularly serves people pass by. You have this person who regularly serves God in his temple. What does he do? Pass by on the other side. Why? Going to be unclean going to be unclean. It says, so he passed by on the other side. Verse 33, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had angst. He had hate. He had loathing. No, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, which some people estimate to be almost a year's worth of salary. He took this out and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Let me tell you what Jesus did here. Jesus found three people who were on opposite ends of the law, who were on opposite ends of the cultural spectrum. And why did Jesus choose these three people? So think about who asked Jesus this question. It was a lawyer. 
And a lawyer doesn't mean what it means in our day. We're not talking about Perry Mason or Matlock or whatever other famous lawyer you can think of. He's talking about a person who is well-versed in the law of Moses. And Jesus chose these three characters in this story because I believe because that lawyer would have related to the priest and the Levite. As he heard this story, he would have thought to himself, they did the right thing. They should have passed by on the other side. They can't make themselves unclean. That goes against the law of Moses. But Jesus is really teaching something in this moment that these people have misinterpreted the law. They've missed the spirit of the law. Is it true that there's a possibility that they would be unclean by helping this beaten robber? Yeah. But Jesus has called us to love our neighbors as ourself. And so the, the lawyer would have related, it would have resonated with him what this priest and this Levite did. But Jesus finds someone on the opposite end of the cultural spectrum, not just a different person. He didn't just say this was a Jew who didn't happen to be a lawyer. This was a Samaritan, which in their context, that's someone who's hated. That's someone who's despised. When they saw Samaritans walk down the street, they would do the same thing they did about the guy that got beaten and left for dead. They would walk to the other side. They didn't want to be near them. So Jesus, he found this juxtaposition. He's basically like, look, bro, you got these two iPhone users and this one Android user, and the Android user helped, and we all like how, but he had an Android. I don't know how he helped, but he helped. <laughs> Sorry, I got an iPhone. Love you, Android people. Y'all are good. But this is what Jesus did, does here. People on opposite ends of the spectrum. The Samaritan in this story to the lawyer, as soon as he heard that word Samaritan, he's probably thinking that's the villain. That's the bad guy. But Jesus makes the villain the hero in his story. And this is where we get into the spiritual principle. So what do I mean when I say a spiritual principle? It's a life lesson. It's a lesson. A principle is something that when you hear it, if you apply it, it should work in your life. Think cause and effect. And so this is where Jesus gets to this point where he says, now I'm going to teach you a life lesson. If we pick up in verse 36, he says, which of these three do you think proved? Think about that word, proved, to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers. Which of these three proved it? And then the lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. So here we have Jesus again. The lawyer trying to trick Jesus, but now Jesus has tricked the lawyer. Because the lawyer thought he was going to win this argument. He thought he was going to win this conversation. But now Jesus has the lawyer admitting that the Samaritan is the one who is right. And again, I want you to think about this from a cultural context. This doesn't mean as much to us because we don't deal with priests and Levites and Samaritans. But in this cultural context, what Jesus has done is he has taken the religious one, the one who's always right, the one who knows everything, and have made them the wrong person. And he's taken the one who was the outcast, the unloved, the one that nobody wanted to be with, and said, this is the person who's doing things the right way. Yeah. And that was heavy for them. And so I believe that Jesus, for us in this, answers two big questions that we need real answers to. And the first question is this, who is my neighbor or who is our neighbor? And again, this doesn't mean a lot to us from the context they were talking about it in because there's no Levites walking around downtown Suffolk. You know, there's no Samaritans. I mean, there might be. Let me not say that. There might be, but not in the same cultural context. So it doesn't mean as much to us. But our neighbor are all those that God has placed near us, regardless of race, creed, orientation, socioeconomic condition, or any other label that you and I can think about to put on them. These are our neighbors. And here's something I've learned about this. It's easy for us to say, I love my neighbor until you're confronted with them. We would come to church on a Sunday morning and the pastor would say, hey, do you love your neighbors? Absolutely, I'm a good Christian. I love my neighbors. What happens when you are confronted, just like these people were in this, in this story that Jesus told, what happens when you're confronted with the Samaritan in your life? What happens when you're confronted with the outcast in your life? What happens when you're confronted with the one who's the total opposite end of the spectrum from where you are? Pastor Jay, what does that look like? Well, here's a picture of some of the neighbors that we might run into, right? So how do you respond when you run into a neighbor that's in one of these 
pictures that's not like you. When you're a good Christian, you've been a good Christian all your life, and now all of a sudden the Muslim family moves in next door. And now you say, I love my neighbor, but now you're confronted with someone who's the opposite end of the spectrum from you. When you've been a good conservative Republican all your life, and now the liberals move in next door. And you're confronted with someone opposite from you. When you've been heterosexual and you believe that God's way of marriage and all this stuff is right, and then the gay couple moves in next door to you, how do you love your neighbor? And this is why it's so important that we understand what true love really is. Because if we don't understand what true love really is, we're going to miss this. We're going to think that it's okay for us to hate our neighbor the same way the Jews thought it was okay for them to hate the Samaritans. In the same way they thought it was okay for them to pass by the robber on the other side of the road, we're going to think we're doing right by God by not loving other people. Because I promise you, that lawyer and that priest and and that Levite thought that they were doing the right thing. They weren't being malicious. They weren't thinking, I'm going to purposefully hurt this person or ignore this person. They believed they were doing what was right, that they were standing up for God, that they were being holy. And Jesus is saying, no, the one that you consider unholy is the only one who handled this situation properly. So Jesus answers that question for us. Who is our neighbor? It's that person, no matter of their race, color, or creed, socioeconomic status, sexual orientation, no matter what the case is, whatever label you can think of, our neighbor is anyone that Jesus or the Lord has put near us. And then Jesus answers this second important question, what does true love look like? What does true love look like? And this passage at the bottom of the slide is from 1 Corinthians 13, 4. You may be familiar with this, whether you've been in church or not, that love is patient, it's kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not arrogant, it does not insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So what does true love look like? True love looks like me going to my neighbor and loving them, no matter what they look like, no matter what condition they're in, no matter where they find themselves today. But this gives us some indications about what true love really does. It's patient. And so what does that mean in our context? That means that when I come to you and you're the total opposite end of the spectrum from me, I need to be patient with you. I need to be kind for you, kind with you, right? Like, I'm not going to go to you and say, you need to be just like me or I'm not going to love you. In fact, true love doesn't say you must be like me for me to love you. True love gives me the space to, to present Jesus to you and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and trust him to conform you to the image of Christ. True love puts me in a place where I am just kind and patient and loving towards you. And I introduce you to this man named Jesus who has so transformed my life through his love. Because guess what? He's patient with me. He's kind with me. He doesn't boast towards me when I do things wrong, but I am so aware of his holiness. He's not arrogant with me, although I know that he is high and lifted up. He does insist on his own way in my life, but that's because he's holy and his way is so much better than mine. He doesn't get irritable with me when I mess up. And for some of you, that's the image of God that you have. That He's just irritable with you every time you make a mistake that God looks down on you, that he hates you, or that he's going to beat you or destroy you every time you mess up. But this tells me that love's not that way. Love doesn't do that to me. You know what his love did offer me? An opportunity to be made right with him when I so didn't deserve it. True love does not say you must be like me for me to love you. And God has demonstrated this kind of love to you and me. And you say, what do I mean by that? John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever, and if you think back to that slide of our neighbors, whoever is on that slide that would believe in him should not perish 
but have eternal life. That lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What you must do to inherit eternal life is receive the gift of God's love in your life that he demonstrates through his son, Jesus. That's the only way you can inherit eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated, I don't need you to be like me for me to love you. I will love you until you become like me. And that's the life that we stepped into. In that while we were still sinners, some of you, all of us in here, sinners saved by grace or sinners who have not yet received that grace, that gift of salvation, all of us are sinners in our life. We all make mistakes in our life. And scripture says that while we were in the midst of the worst sin we could possibly commit, God loved us and he demonstrated it. He didn't just say it. He demonstrated it. And this is what I would say to you about your neighbors. You can't just say it. We need to demonstrate it. That we love them. And so often, church, we are guilty of just that. We say the right things all the time. We are church. We love our neighbors. Are we demonstrating it? Can people look at our lives and see that we love them even when they're not like us? Or when when they see us, are they thinking there's just another bunch of hateful people? Are we demonstrating it? And so here we get to the application. The application. Oh, I'm a few slides behind on my notes. All right, good deal. And here's what I want you to understand about this application. It reveals which heart you have. Whether you have the heart of the Samaritan or the heart of the priest and the Levite. And here's what Jesus says in the next verse, verse uh, 37, the second part of it. He says, you go and do likewise. Now, if you think back for a second, what does Jesus mean here. Jesus asked the question, which one of these three demonstrated that they were a neighbor to the man who had been beaten and robbed? And the man's answer, the lawyer's answer was the one who showed him mercy. And then Jesus says, you go and do likewise. You go and do likewise. And so my question for you today is this, will you go and do likewise? Will you be the one who will go and show mercy? Will you be the one who goes and demonstrates love to your neighbor? Will you go And will you do? And now's where we really need to be totally honest and transparent. The answer is no. Not if we try to do it in our own power. Not if we try to do it in our own strength. Because here's the truth about this. Every lesson Jesus taught, every parable Jesus taught, every sermon Jesus taught, all pointed back to one thing. We are incapable of doing any of this apart from him. We have to be so in him to be able to step out in him and do these things. Because what happens is we'll hear a message like this and we'll leave here today. And I've been convicted all week as I'm studying. And now you're hearing this message and you'll leave and say, I need to love my neighbors. And you will go out and you will make a valiant effort. And if you do it in your own strength, a week from now, a neighbor will upset you and you will hate that group again. You'll see something on the news about the liberals are doing this or the conservatives are doing this or I can't believe Trump's running here and I can't believe what's going on with President Biden and I can't believe the Muslims are over here doing this. And you'll get so caught up in all of that that you will start to hate your neighbor again whether you realize it or not. If you do it in your own power. We can't do any of this in our own power and our own strength. We have to rest in the strength of God. You think about all these parables, and Pastor Brian kicked it off on Father's Day talking about the prodigal son. And so often we look at how the son made this decision and he came back, but guess what? It was the father. The son needed a father who would receive him. He couldn't do it on his own. He needed a father to receive him. We think about this good Samaritan. You and I can't do this stuff on our own. We need the power of God, the love of God inside of us to be used as a vessel and a conduit for his love to flow through us. We can't do this on our own. All of these parables demonstrate to you and to me and to the people who are hearing them, we need Jesus. We need him. Think about the boldness of Christ in that moment, standing there preaching to the crowd and saying, this is what you should do, but I know you're not capable of doing it. But my father sent me so that you would have the ability to do it. 
And I'm going to die in your place so that you can be conformed to my image and you can be put back in right standing with him. But I'm not just going to stop there. I'm going to ascend back into heaven. I'm going to be your high priest. I'm going to pray over you that you would have the strength to do these things. But I'm not just going to stop there. I'm going to send my Holy Spirit to dwell in you and he will conform you to my image and he will make you my witness. And it is in his power that then you can go out and love your neighbor. But if we try to do it in any other way, we're going to mess this up. We have to be in his power. Here's your big takeaway for today. You and I cannot love truly until we rest in the realization of how we've been truly loved by God. And here's what I mean by this. When you don't rest in the realization of how truly loved you you are by God, you fall into prove it mode. This is what the life of the Levites and the priests and all those people who were religious and all the religious people around us today is all about. They don't rest in the realization of how God truly loves them, so they have to prove it. And when you live in prove it mode, what it does is it makes you compare yourself to your neighbor. And the reason that you end up hating your neighbor or despising your neighbor is because you look at your neighbor through the lens of, I am better at proving it than they are. I am better at proving that I'm holy than they are. I am better at proving that I'm right with God than they are. And so we look down on them and we despise them, not realizing that we need God's grace each and every day. Let me tell you something, church. The only reason you don't fall back into sin and to despair is because God's grace keeps you. There's nothing we can do apart from Jesus. The fact that we can even attempt to live a holy life is because of the grace of God and the power of his Holy Spirit. There's nothing you and I could ever do. Left to our own devices, we would all fall straight back into sin. And we would be just like those neighbors that we look down on. So you and I cannot truly love truly until we rest in the realization of how we have been truly loved by God. And that's where that, that Romans 5, 8 is so important, that God demonstrated his love for you, and that while you were still a sinner in the midst of your sin, even today, he knew you would be here in this place. He knew you would be hearing this message, and he wants you to know that he sent his son to die for you, not after you get your life right, but to help you get your life right. He's not waiting for you to get fixed first. He wants to be the one to fix you, to conform you to the image of his son. And that is how we go out and truly love our neighbors. This impacts how we live in relationship with other people. I can't truly live in a love relationship with someone else until I realize and rest in the fact that I am truly loved by God. I can never love my wife purely. I can never love my kids purely until I realize just how loved I am by the Father. I want to read a passage of Scripture to you. It's from 1 John. It's not going to be on your screen. But it's... 1 John chapter 4, just verses 7 through 21. He says this, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation, the substitute for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the father has sent the son to be the savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, God abides in him. And he is God. So if that is your confession, God abides in you. So we have come to know and to believe that the love that God has for us, God is love. And whoever abides in his love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because as he is, so are also we in this world. There is no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. 
And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. God abides in you, which means that his love abides in you. And the demonstration of that is that you love your brother. And the greatest commandment that we have is what? To love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it, to love our neighbors as ourselves. But remember, you and I are incapable of doing this apart from Jesus. I'm going to invite the band to come back up and join me on stage. And I'm actually going to invite you all to stand together. And we're going to step into response time here in just a moment. And as they, as they get set up, I want to share the lyrics to a song. I like sharing old songs because I'm an old guy and I like old music. But I want to share the lyrics to a song with you. And it's a song I listened to growing up. But the lyrics were this. Think about his love. Think about his goodness. Think about his grace that's brought us through. For as high as the heavens above, So great is the measure of our Father's love. Great is the measure of our Father's love. And, you know, when I initially started writing this message, the the response time was going to be about, I want you to sit down and identify who's your neighbor that you don't love, who's the neighbor you need to get right with, and maybe you need to do some of that. But the more I studied and the more I prepared, the more I felt the spirit and the heart of God in this was, Do you understand how truly loved you are by God? Because until you realize that, all of that other stuff means nothing. And so as we get ready to sing together, and again, I'm going to ask you guys to stand and sing with us. As we get ready to sing this next song, I want you to think about the words to this song, how truly loved you are by God. And then I want you to make a confession at that point that, God, now that I understand your love, now that I realize your love, I'm ready to go out and live this love that you've given me to the world around me. Because it's in that that we will truly learn to love our neighbor. So, Danielle, I'm going to turn it over to you. Let's stand and worship the Lord together again.